Hello and welcome to the series of conversations called Minding the Business Mind. Conversations in which we explore various facets of executive wellness and growth with business leaders, HR leaders and consultants. In today's context, the executive is under tremendous pressure and therefore his wellness and his inner growth is of paramount importance not only for his personal well-being but for well-being, safety and health of people working with him and as well as continuity of business. In today's episode, we have with us Chitra Gurjar. Chitra is a consultant and coach in the area of product engineering. And she comes with very rich 24 years of experience of working with the sea suit. She is also an avid basketball player. And she has competed and won many a basketball games. So, a hearty welcome to you, Chitra. Thank you, Indranil. It's a pleasure to be here and be part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Look forward to uh, a very rich, wholesome and authentic conversation with you. And I really, really hope that business leaders who would be listening to it would get a few things to reflect upon and integrate with their lives. So Chitra, I hope so as well. Thank you. So my first question to you is about the life conditions of business leaders today. It has never been easy, but COVID-19 where the unusual has now become usual has made it very, very complex. I've been talking to some business leaders and uh, I find that they are quite uncomfortable with the situation that they are having to face today. So what do you think are some of the challenges they are confronting? And most importantly, why are they confronting these challenges? Thank you, Indranil. Um, with respect to what kind of challenges some of the business leaders are confronting, and these are based on some conversations that I've had with some of some business leaders in the past few weeks. I think it's um, for once the term "black swan event," which you know something that has not had a precedence has taken everyone aback. Um, the challenges also stem from the fact that there is always this feeling in a lot of business leaders that come what may I will face this problem or challenge and we'll get through it. So somehow this situation has turned that very statement on its head. It's not uh, responding or it's not reacting to any solution that I put out there. And I, I am getting about 100 solutions every day. Try this, try that, do this, do that. But nothing seems to be working. So that's, that's one challenge. So I am probably having to go back to the drawing board each time. And that doesn't sit well with me. Because I, I am now a leader, or I, I've always been a leader. Uh, there is a certain expectation that I know the answers to these problems. Mm. However, uh, it, it's not, I, I'm not able to actually pin down any solutions and 
move on now this is not business as usual contrary to expectation so these are some of the challenges and what was your next question yeah so and why why of course you have also covered the why 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 yeah what are some of the challenges they are confronting and why so you you kind of yeah. covered the why also beautifully covered the why so uh, this one this one more point i'd like to add see expectations sure. from expect it's not only expectations from within the organization it's also expectations from the ecosystem of the organization Mm. so when i say ecosystem of the organization and when i look at an organization as one entity when you are delivering a service or a product right the this organization is part of an ecosystem the ecosystem has vendors partners suppliers customers um and everybody else that is that is enabling the delivery of a product or a solution so and you, of course there are other things like you know compliance regulatory statutory and all of these in turn have been impacted in some way or the other you know today uh, rules and regulations are changing by the minute mm. for example i heard that so there was a rule that was set aside by sdpi and department of telecom which actually inhibited companies to enable their employees to work from home <laughs> now it took a, a very quick collective to sit down with entities like nascom and sdpi and they did they had to so so what i'm saying is the challenge has even gone far beyond that the government has had to sit down very quickly and revert some of these uh, policies or laws to quickly enable companies to re to respond to the needs of employees and enable them or set them up to be working from home without violating anything so it's not only one thing it's i think a multiple add to many, that many, uh, many things yeah and add to that that this element of working virtually uh mm. was not there since you brought this up working from home i i was chatting up with somebody who heads an organization and he said my biggest challenge is that and they they are in manufacturing industry so mm. uh a part of his team is out there in the factories however part of his team which is more into administrative work are working from home and as a business leader he is required to coordinate in a seamless fashion so that the deliveries are not impacted you think about the complexity you talked about complexity the coordination complexity i'm talking about that is one part of it the other is the supply chain part of it expectations that the deliveries will be unhindered that revenue would happen that business will grow may not be at a pace which was forecasted but at some but today's lockdown it is not even right so today the states are talking about lockdown in which is more uh, should i say mm, region specific depending upon whether you are in a containment zone or you are in a a zone or a red zone or a yellow zone or a green zone and managing this complexity from a supply chain perspective just think about that yep and so, i've heard similar similar stories as well yeah yep so thank you so much with that we'll move to the second question chitra so with with such challenges and as you underscored that at the root of all these challenges is multi stakeholder expectation of the business leader whether 
it is a valid expectation and not a valid expectation. We cannot comment on that. But the expectations very much are there and the business has been running basis those expectations up until now. Now with such expectations weighing down upon these business leaders, what do you think it is doing to their personal or their inner growth and well-being? How is it impacting their inner growth and well-being? And if you could elucidate with some examples, it will be nice because our focus of this series is not what the leader is doing, but what is his state of being. So if you could throw some light on this. So, um, I think there are a lot of things that a leader would be going through. One of them would be the incessant need, almost, um, yes, incessant need to continuously respond, continuously respond. And I think that in itself puts an almost inhuman expectation onto the individual and rather than um, and I wonder if there is even time to sense what is happening to be able to respond. So how do you think the leader is responding without sensing? I think a lot of leaders are trying their best to sense but how the question coming to me is, how can one continuously be sensing and responding? You will react at some point in time. So, Just are you saying the sheer all that which, of... Yeah, so are you saying that a lot of what we see as response, and not just mm. see but read about also, is actually knee-jerk reactions, which are coming from yes. habitual patterns of having reacted in crisis in a certain way. Yes. Okay, great. So in this context, now this is again, you are talking about what the leader is doing. But what is happening to the inner growth and well-being of that leader in, in doing all this? Because this is against nature, right? We are not here to react as natural beings. We are here to respond, sense and respond. How beautifully you said that I am not sure whether he is sensing at all and if he's not sensing at all I'm not sure whether he's responding at all. Now th that's against the law of not nature. So something must be happening to his inner self at, at an emotional level, at a mental level and the other thing is something might also be happening to his growth, his overall growth because if he's not growing uh, you know what doesn't grow, doesn't live. Yes, uh, Indranil, and I think you, you put it very well in the sense. Uh, I think listening at all levels must be coming to a halt. And when I say at all levels, uh, it starts with listening to what's going on inside of you. Stopping to see what's going on inside of you. Uh, in fact, one thing that's coming to my mind is, you know, very often in these situations, your body is also telling you something. Are you listening to that? You know, it, it manifests, and from personal experience, it manifests in the form of backaches, small, tiny pinpricks that are there, maybe on your shoulder or at the tips of your fingers. Because you're constantly either typing out a message mm. or you are on the laptop. So this is, there's so much of this feedback that is happening. And are we even listening to it? Awesome. My, own, my own thing is to, okay, it's there. It's not bothering me. I, I'm not being impacted by it. Let me just go on. Let me finish this one more thing. Let me respond to this one more email. Let me get on to this one more call. I'll interrupt. And then I have to. Yeah. 
I really, really appreciate you bringing up this point because the dashboard of physical symptoms is always blinking and they are just symptoms. Yes. They are just symptoms. They are pointing to some deeper uh, complications which might be just rearing its head and wanting to show up inside you. For example, could be a, a cardiac situation. For example, it could be a, a, a anxiety, chronic anxiety or depression. But these show up as physical symptoms and the very fact whether they are listening to it or not itself is a big cause for alarm. If I don't yes. listen to the early warning system, then the system is of no use and then I am exposing myself to grief, well-being situation and wellness situations which I am and I'm getting prone to faster and faster. That's what you are actually underlining from what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Great. Great. Please go on. It even starts with the moment you wake up and you first put your feet down. How are you feeling? I even stopping to think about that. And again, from personal experience, when, um, there is a build-up in a crisis. I have felt that heaviness of not being able to stand up. And then you're forcing yourself to stand up and get through the day. Are you breathing enough? Yeah. Are you yeah. even realizing that very often your breath is just stuck? Mm. So these are some of the questions that I'm sure... Or, or these are some of the symptoms that I'm quite sure a lot of the leaders experience. And I wonder if, you know, what, they what, have what enough about, time to set aside. What about sleep? What about appetite? More, more grosser symptoms, I would say. What you talked about <laughs> are subtle but very, Not very me. significant symptoms. But then there are gross symptoms of sleeplessness and loss of appetite, uh, irritation. Would you like to talk of that? Absolutely. In fact, um, when you eat, you know, the first meal of the day, breakfast, are you aware of what's going in? Are you aware of the taste, the texture, even for those 10 minutes, maybe? I think... Uh, there's a lot of mindless eating which happens, eating for the sake of maybe, uh, you know, given the context of the fact that you're at home, somebody calls you to the table and says, hey, breakfast is ready or lunch is ready. You simply, sometimes you even ignore it. So to your point, Indranil, um, we're completely out of whack with everything. And that is abnormal. And I'm sure that's happening. Mm -hmm. to a lot of people okay let me let me quickly grab some lunch even the phrase grab some lunch so that or let me eat at my desk or talk to uh, uh, be on call while eating so I save time yeah and right? and then yes and then when I put this, this, this thing down or whenever I call it a night this, I, I this posture, this posture is a very, <laughs> people have become used to this posture, no? while driving, while eating, while reading, while even talking to each other face to face. This is a new yeah. add-on posture, right? Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I don't know what it does to the audience, but it's making me think it's it's about all of us how conscious we are of we are of what we, we are doing how conscious we are of how we are feeling now that was the well-being aspect chitra now what is happening to the growth aspect of the leaders 
because leaders need to keep themselves updated. And I'm not talking of the staid, uh, overemphasized need for being updated with skills. It is not about skills. At a, leadership's, at a leadership level, it is more about intelligence. It's more about wisdom. So how are they in this kind of a situation managing to keep themselves at that level of intelligence, at that level of wisdom? Are they at all able to do that? And if they are not, well, what, what could be the consequences? Like you talked about some possible consequences of unwell-being or habits which are taking us towards a lack of well-being. So would you like to throw some light on uh, habits which possibly are impacting our inner growth? So I think we, um, I think some leaders have managed to make this time for themselves to to pause, to reflect, and to seek counsel with others who are uh, who are there, who will walk alongside with them, who are non non judgmental, non threatening. But I I am not sure if there are enough of them seeking help. First, acknowledging and accepting to oneself that I cannot do all of this alone. I am not able to manage it. And it is affecting my ability to, for, at, at a first level, even function. At a second level, uh, become come back to a state where I can sense and be more aware. And so to be able to even center myself or come back and get a sense of what's going on, can I first acknowledge and uh, then seek that help? I think more of that needs to happen. Mm. Some of it is happening. I think a lot more needs to happen. Great, Chitra. You are actually preempting my next question. <clears throat> so the next question is, you have already talked about challenges related to personal wellness and inner growth or personal growth of business leaders. Now the question is, how are they coping with these challenges? What preventive measures, if any, are they taking to sustain their mental and emotional health? So I think so, a, a lot of, what, one uh, significant change that I noticed, at least in the last couple of years is... Uh, I'll interrupt. Uh, the, yeah. the underlying question which I did not spell out is, are they at all coping with these challenges? Because now that you have brought up that they may not be even aware that there is a challenge, brings this question also, are they at all doing anything about it? I'm not sure of whether they are doing anything at all about it. I can only hypothesize at this point. Uh, okay. And the reason I say that is, um, I really haven't asked this question to anyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I think what I do is perhaps speak about my own experience here, mm -hmm. if that's helpful. Sure. Uh, I have hesitated to seek help mm. and somehow just continued. So then I tend to hold myself in a state of uh, stasis, okay, whatever that state is, just just moving from day to day, and at the end of the say, day, saying, "Okay, this day is over. That's it." Um, to some extent, I did look to see what quick fixes I can, you know, use. So, try to do that you know, 45 minute workout or you go for a walk. Maybe some of it was helpful. But if I 
uh, look back, I am not sure if they, they were just they were just patches. They were just yeah. band-aids so at I, I, this point in time. It's a very relevant thing that you brought up, working out or going for a walk. Now, juxtapose it to the challenges that you spoke about a little while back, which are uh, of psychological, emotional, mental in nature. So, my pray please uh, enlighten us. Is the workout going to help us? Is the walk going to help us to cope with, for example, some building up stress or the onset of anxiety or the onset of depression or the onset of uh, maybe even addiction for that matter. I I think it I think it just brings temporary relief. It's more of a uh, okay those half an hour forty five minutes just take me away from whatever my troubles are temporarily. But the minute I'm done with it, those troubles don't go away. They come back probably in full force and maybe even more amplified. What about the happiness? I'm not going What about the happiness hormones people talk about that are released when you're working out or when you are uh, taking a vigorous walk? The question I have here is when you're working out and when you're taking that vigorous walk, and because I've noticed this in myself, do those anxieties and thoughts stop? No, they don't. They keep coming. And then you're not actually paying attention to the workout or the walk. You're following those thoughts. Mm. You're following those thoughts. So then you come back. For example, I've noticed that sometimes I come back with a to-do list. <laughs> What's the point? Mm. Oh, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. I didn't do this. Oh, I should have done this. <laughs> and then as soon as I'm, I'm done with my workout, I'm off trying to do those things. Mm. So one other uh, preventive measure is seeking solace and working longer hours. You're compounding the problem. Yeah, all the hours of sleeplessness are now being dedicated to work, right? I'm working till 4 a.m. in the morning. This is, uh, uh, you know, a chip on the shoulder. I'm talking especially of business leaders who are into startups. I've heard quite a few of them. Yes, um, I've heard quite a few of them also. They get, you get into this mode of doing and doing and doing. Uh, because of the environment also around that is expecting you to do, oh, you're in a startup, then you should be working 20 hours a day. So uh, I've heard that as well. And then there is all of what we just spoke about is you eat at odd hours, you sleep at odd hours or not at all. So unless this whole machine that we are born with, right, it didn't come with a manual, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 and I think um, I know this is going into some sort of solution space but I think each of us needs to recognize that first we have to understand this, this whole system and the ecosystem or the environment that we live in and then build our own maintenance manuals yeah. and which is so important which is so important I think uh, in somewhere in our conversation, you did talk about only uh, uh, one cardinal point. If there was a manual, I think there would have been one cardinal point, and that cardinal point would be just be aware of what you are doing or how you are. And if that one point of the manual is taken care of, uh, so many other things are taken care of. Absolutely. You spoke about it a little while back. Yes, yeah, so I think even to be aware of what, what you're doing or who you are at any given point in time, I think it takes some practice. It takes some step back and guidance. 
Yeah. Definitely. And guidance. You know, at that point in time, I was like very often when I'm in, uh, when I've been in meetings that uh, where the, uh, where the situation is tense and there is a crisis and uh, things are not brewing, they are bubbling at that time. Uh, I've always wished that there was a, there was a sentinel in the room to just, you know, maybe just slightly pull you back and say, okay, just, just pause, take a breath, watch what's happening. Mm. Beautiful. You know, can this sentinel be there to, for everyone? So, Chitra, you are actually, uh, you are wonderfully cueing me to the next questions. I was about to ask you, would you like to share with the audience some of the uh, practices that you are following in your own life to sustain well-being? And when I'm saying well-being, I'm talking of holistic well-being, mind, body, soul, and also to sustain your inner growth. Sure, Indranil, and thank you for asking that question. I think the first thing is the realization of this mind, body, soul, energy combined. I think only started coming to me very recently. Uh, one thing, if I could go back in time, is like I said just now, wish there was someone to you know pull back, pull me back perhaps a few years earlier and put me in on this path of understanding that all these elements have to work together and at any given point in time, one of them can go out of sync. Okay, because we can't control everything around us, but definitely we can control or understand our own, this, this whole system, this mind, body, soul whatever it is. So I think to that effect, uh, first was, the first step for me was to understand that uh, I cannot do everything on my own and that I, I need help and to seek that help. So that people like you and several others have, have been there for me when I have needed that kind of help and guidance. Uh, simply pick up the phone and say, you know, can I talk to you? And uh, the way people like you have opened up, that itself, I think, has is so much relief. There's so much of a pressure off. And now you know that you can start down uh, without any fear of being judged, without any fear of expectation. I can open myself up to exploration. Uh, with the intent of understanding myself better. So I think that having that support system around is, is very important and I have spent time in nurturing and creating that for myself. Uh, second thing is um, having been a, an athlete and a player, I now have a very different understanding of exercise and uh, practice. Right? Um, even, even the practice of yoga is different. It's not, it's not about the asanas. It's not about the uh, postures that you're able to do, but it, it's a lot more. It's a very deep mind, body, soul connect. And for that, you have to work with somebody to a, a coach, a guide, a guru, to help you see that. And then when you practice, the practice is very different. And then the, the other thing has been, you know, systems of medicine that uh, can help you at various stages in your life. Um, I've always been, although my, my mother is an allopathic <coughs> doctor, has always opened me up to alternative systems of medicine. And working with an Ayurvedic doctor, I've seen tremendous improvement in my overall health, energy levels, uh, sleep patterns, eating patterns, hunger, 
digestion, all of it. So I think keeping all these things in mind has, has made a significant uh, difference to me. I've noticed during these last couple of months, ever since uh, this pandemic has uh, taken over the world, I've gone through my own situation of you know chaos, confusion, and every little thing that seems to be happening was amplified. Yeah, so, uh, also the I think I've understood that the environment around me is has given messages and has constantly giving messages. So, on the one hand, there is the situation, but on the other hand, like for example, when I'm having this conversation with you, I am noticing these leaves of this mango tree that's right outside. And through this season, we've enjoyed the fruits of that tree. Um, and now I can see all, you know, old leaves and new leaves together, different colors. I think um, that understanding has you know, really helped me a lot. And one thing I want to mention here, you know, I joined a task force as a Corona warrior. Ah, yeah. Uh, during these times. Um, and very frankly, what triggered me to go there was, I think two couple of days after the lockdown, there was so much of uh, worry, concern, anxiety about what's going to happen. I, and when this, this call came out, it was a collaborative effort by the government and common citizens. I just responded and said, okay, I'm going to sign up for it. Let me at least go and see what's happening out there. I need to know. And I need to be out there. So uh, I think that maybe merits another conversation by itself. But I thought that, you know, I want to put this down here that despite all that's going on around us, the kind of compassion, kindness and collaboration that I've seen is phenomenal, is simply phenomenal. All boundaries have been dissolved. Nobody in power or authority is saying do this or do that. No one has any expectation of anything. And uh, this is something that uh, a lot of my friends are small industry owners. And uh, everybody was complaining that the rules are changing every day. I said as much as you don't know, they don't know either. Mm. And what, what I saw is a willingness to experiment say, you draft one set of rules today, but it's okay, we'll change them tomorrow. Because we'll simply know the situation better. So there's no getting it right uh, the Absolutely. first Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think all those normals have been uh, redefined completely. Yeah. And in fact, today's a time where I hope that people can use these, this, these experiences to simply create new systems, ah, absolutely. new ways of working. Yeah. Why does anything have to be defined at all? Mm -hmm. Take it as it comes. Just take it as it comes. Okay, for today, you are able to deliver ration to uh, 13,000 people. Good. Tomorrow, let's see how many more sign up, how many more need it. You don't have to get that number right the first time. Mm. Okay. Uh, agility and, uh, in the true sense. Absolutely, absolutely. So, did we get the ration requirements right the first time? No. Then, only when the beneficiaries came back and said, see, the ration that you gave will last me only for four days. Because I made an assumption on the way my family eats, not the recipient's family. And we immediately were able to give a turnaround and give ration that can last them at least a week. So these things were learned on the job. Mm. Now, how will you, uh, you cannot monitor and police people. Mm -hmm. Can you at least say, please try to avoid going out? You're putting yourself in danger, you're putting others in danger. You cannot, what can you moralize? You cannot do that. But can you create this sense of awareness that, hey, by staying home, you're probably enabling others to do their job better. So all these were learnings from these, this experience of four or five weeks on the ground. And I think every day 
I came back with a lot of anger, a lot of frustration of why doesn't this work? Why doesn't somebody follow this rule? And then go back and say that there is no rule. Mm. There is no, uh, you know, nobody has to tow her line. Everybody is facing this situation. So what is it that you can learn for today? Do it and then see what happens. So I think it, there, there is a lot of possibility. Uh, this situation has definitely taught me a lot. And I'm very positive and very hopeful that, you know, even for leaders, something will emerge out of this. Great. So, so I think uh, you, you're bringing it to a close and it's been very, very uh, wholesome up until now. But before we close, the audience would like to have a few recommendations, especially for the business leaders in terms of sustaining their personal growth and well-being. And an important thing is, I think you talked about it right at the beginning, that in all this milieu, they are alone, they are lonely. They, they don't have anyone to talk about. So how do you think they can uh, deal with and cope with this situation of what is called as executive isolation? So a few recommendations, maybe two, three. And with that, we will close today's session. I think the first thing I want to share is you're not alone, despite what you feel. No, okay. So alone. let me let me let me okay. uh, let me amplify on that. that the the responsibilities, the expectations, the kind of uh, looking up that people do with leaders. There, there is a lot that they cannot share with people. General people, I'm talking about their own people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. They might be going out and playing golf, but they cannot uh, share much beyond uh, a, a few, uh, you know, anecdotes here and there. They they might be uh, uh, talking to some friends, but it will all be party talk or very simple pastime. So deep inside, deep inside, all the uh, you know, the, the what-ifs, the insecurities are, have not been shared with anybody. It is still inside. So this has been happening even before the pandemic. There is nothing new about it. But in the situation of the pandemic, this has got accentuated because the challenges have got accentuated. And therefore, my inner response to the challenges have got accentuated. So if you have any recommendations of dealing with a very technical term called executive isolation and also how to sustain personal well-being and growth. So I want to say there's, there's one thought coming to my mind when you said executive isolation. I'm going back to that executive sentinel or that executive uh, a company, a companyist, like you wrote in your article, Indranil. Recommendation is seek, look at ways of you know, finding that help. And I think it's very, very important. Somebody who can walk alongside, just be there and try to look at those inner what ifs. And along with this individual who can help you look at those waters without any fear, without any apprehension. And I think being comfortable with being vulnerable, at least with that accompanist, with this, this partner. I think that, that would be very, very helpful. Anything and from, us, yeah. Yeah, so I, what I wanted to say is just, you know, setting aside time for oneself. Mm -hmm. 
I think that can be done. So there's this uh, uh, concept that a colleague of mine has, has shared very often and that, that resonates with me is uh, me time and then our time and then others time. So can you set aside that me time every day, even if it's 15 minutes? Start off with that. And in, the, in, the, in, the, in the me time also, I'm making a to-do list. How is it going to <laughs> I think first start off by making that me time and don't do anything in that. Fair time. enough. I've made the me time. What, what, what is it that you're recommending thereafter? It's a wonderful time for me to reflect upon strategies for tomorrow which does not exist. Because I'm habituated to making strategies for tomorrow. <laughs> maybe and use this me time. Maybe if, why not use this me time? to actually connect with someone who can help you, who can navigate with you, and then who can help you navigate. So what about you talked about, I, I was very uh, fascinated with uh, the kind of yoga that you talked about. What about disciplines and mindfulness for that matter? Very much. And I think for that first is carving out that time, you know, the disciplines and mindfulness and finding the right people who can, who can guide you through it, who can, who can walk you through it. Okay. So, so personally, I believe it's very important to have a good teacher, to have a, and this teacher being a mentor, a partner, a coach, is is a great bonus but if it if if it's not all rolled into one but it's it's okay to have different people for different needs got it for you got it what about medicine you in you talked about your own uh, help from the ayurvedic system people are popping up medicine but they they are chemicals i i know of somebody who is living on nexitu and managing to fix the mood. So your recommendations with medicine systems. I think I've, I've always looked at a combination of homeopathy and Ayurveda for various reasons. I mean, for many years, I have extensively used these systems of medicine and developed a very close relationship with these doctors. And what I see in these systems is the, the approach is, is exactly with the mind, body, soul approach. So, for example, in Ayurveda, the, the method of diagnosis itself is through your body type, the, the, your nature, right? How your nature and your body are. Okay. And what I also see in both systems of medicine is that it's not a one-time medicine that will fix a certain problem. Yeah. Always. Um, and this, surprisingly, people have never noticed about allopathic doctors as well. Um, but I also do know a lot of them who, when they recommend a certain prescription, always say, please let me know how you are feeling. Right? And there's so few people that pause to give that feedback. I agree and with you. That, that is what in all three systems of medicine, I think, enables the doctor perform their job better. Or you, do and understand you better, understand your body better. You and therefore help you heal and recover. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you spoke uh, fantastically about certain systems of medicines, for example, Ayurveda and homeopathy and I personally 100% uh, endorse both of them because I've been living on both of them for I don't know at least 10 years or even more perhaps uh, but I don't know whether you're aware there's a close cousin of homeopathy called batch flower therapy which takes care I've heard of, it. of the men mental and emotional health when I say close cousin is because both of them are vibrational medicines and uh, that the three of them put together, I think, is 
uh, an entire world of uh, wellness and well-being. I uh, am told, I don't know how much of it is true, that people who are living on these medicines are highly unlikely to contract coronavirus infection. <laughs> and I, it has come from an expert for that matter. I went to my homeopath and I asked him, do you have any, any prevention? He said, for you it's already prevented. You've been living on this medicine for so many years. It's very unlikely that this infection is going to affect you. So also, it's not just about uh, mental or emotional well-being. It is mind, body and soul. Your body is also protected. You don't need to panic. You don't need to, uh, uh, you know, the first symptoms of cough or sneezing, you don't need to feel that you are getting it because you are protected if you are with one or more of these medicine systems. So with that, thank you Chitra, thank you very much. We will sign off. For those who don't know me, I am Indronil. Indronil Mukherjee is my full name. And I have been walking this journey for the last 20 years or so, a little more than that. Walking this journey as in the journey of enabling human lives. And I've been doing it through learning. I've been doing it with talent development. I've been doing it with discovery. And recently I have moved into wellness. Last 10 years I'm into transformational coaching. And I'm also practicing mindfulness and also help people to practice mindfulness. So with that, we sign off for today. And very soon we'll come back with another series of conversation, another episode of conversation. It was great, Chitra, for, uh, uh, you know, sparing your time and not just time, but the intentful conversation that you uh, got into. In fact, there were many a times that uh, I got reflecting on whatever you were saying. Thank you so much, Chitra, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much, Indranil. And likewise, this conversation has left me with a lot more questions and a wonderful time for reflection. So I have to thank you for this opportunity. Pleasure. Pleasure.